Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we're having a look at an iconic piece of telegraphy equipment. This is a Vibroplex semi-automatic key and this was developed around the turn of the 20th century as a faster and more ergonomic alternative to the traditional or straight telegraph key. Now the very first Morse key, basically just a spring-loaded momentary lever switch, was developed in 1844 by an associate of Samuel Morse named Alfred Vail was known as the Vail Lever Correspondent. Now, over the next few decades, this design slowly evolved until in 1881, Jesse Bunnell patented the classic Triumph key, and this became standard all around the world and has remained relatively unchanged until the present day. However, telegraphers who spent day after day pounding brass, as they say, often came down with an affliction known as glass arm, which today we would recognize as carpal tunnel syndrome, or more generally, a repetitive strain injury, or RSI, which could, and very often did, cost telegraphers their livelihoods. Now, one of the first attempts to remedy this came in 1888, when the J.H. Bunnell Company came out with the double speed key, which had a lever that swung side to side, rather than up or down. And in 1902, Charles Yetman developed a typewriter keyboard that translated regular keystrokes directly into Morse letters, though sadly, this failed to take off. And in that same year, another inventor, Horace Greeley Martin, came up with an enhanced version of the side swinger key, where swinging the lever to one side would just complete the contact, producing a continuous tone or dash, whereas flicking it the other way would activate an electromagnetic buzzer or doorbell mechanism, which would automatically generate a string of dots. And so by swinging between the two, you could send Morse code messages more quickly, more ergonomically, and more consistently than using a straight key. Now, Martin's development work was funded by the publisher Walter P. Phillips, who in 1903 formed the United Electrical Manufacturing Company, or UEM, to manufacture and sell Martin's design under the trade name Autoplex. Now, while the Autoplex was effective, it was also very expensive, costing around twice the average telegrapher's weekly salary, and it also required big, heavy batteries to operate. So Martin went back to the drawing board and tried to come up with something purely mechanical and a lot simpler and cheaper. But unfortunately, he was beaten to the punch by one William O. Coffey working for the rival Mechograph Company of Cleveland, Ohio. And Coffey's design, which he patented in January 1904, used a spring-loaded pendulum instead of an electromagnetic buzzer to generate the string of dots, and it was thus much simpler and cheaper to manufacture. Undeterred, Martin came up with his own version with a horizontal rather than a vertical pendulum, which he patented in May 1904. However, since Mechograph had already patented and started to sell its design, UEM, in a very ballsy move, decided to sue Mechograph for patent infringement, claiming that they had copied their design rather than the other way around. And this only succeeded in delaying the issuance of Coffee's patent until 1906, whereupon Mechograph turned the tables and sued UEM for patent infringement. And this time, they won and William Coffey was declared the originator of the fully mechanical semi-automatic telegraph key. However, and yes, this is a very complex story, because Coffey's patents were full of very crude and ambiguous drawings, this court ruling didn't preclude either company from continuing to market their products. So Horace Martin came up with yet another improvement on his 1904 patent, which he then sold under the name Vibroplex. You see, both Coffee and Martin's original designs worked on the so-called release principle, where the pendulum was pre-tensioned using a mainspring and only released or set in motion by the movement of the telegraph key. However, in Martin's 1905 redesign, the Vibroplex, the telegraph key and the pendulum were connected together by the mainspring, and the pendulum was set into motion directly by the motion of the key. 
This turned out to be a lot more effective, and the Viroplex outsold the Micrograph keys by a wide margin. Nonetheless, in 1908, UEM folded, and Horace Martin partnered with James Albright and set up his own workshop in New York City to continue manufacturing and selling Viroplex keys. And in 1903, when the founder and head of Micograph, Benjamin Bellow, suddenly died, Albright was able to purchase the company off of his widow and incorporate it into his own, which he renamed the Micograph and Viberplex Company, later simply the Viberplex Company. And finally, in 1920, Martin was bought out from the company and left Viberplex, though he continued to consult and come up with different upgrades to Viberplex products until his death in 1939. Right, so let's have a closer look at this key and see how it works. And you'll see that in the photo booth here, I've connected it up to a vacuum tube oscillator so you can hear the key in action. So in order to use this, you grasp this knob and paddle assembly at the end between your middle finger and your thumb. You can flick it from one side to the other. So if you flick it to the left, you can see that the end of the arm is hinged and will touch this contact, completing the circuit and sending a continuous tone or dash. However, if you flick to the right, you're going to set this pendulum in motion, rapidly opening and closing this spring-loaded contact here and sending a continuous string of dots. And so by flicking this back and forth, I can compose a Morse code message far more rapidly and with a greater deal of consistency than with a straight key. Now, of course, since I'm still composing my dashes by hand, this is known as a semi-automatic key. And of course, when composing dots, you need to release the knob at the exact moment to get the number of dots you need. And this takes quite a bit of practice to master. And if I want to adjust the frequency of those dots, the sending speed, all I need to do is slide this weight along the pendulum to change its oscillation period. Now, a couple of other features to point out here include this little circular weight at the end, which acts as a damper for the pendulum as well as this switch at the front, which we'll find on many telegraph keys, which is known as a circuit closer. So in a traditional telegraph network, all of the users are connected in series, party line style, so that if anybody leaves their part of the circuit open, it's going to disable the entire network. So as soon as you were finished transmitting, you would close the switch, closing off your section of the circuit and allowing everybody else to continue transmitting and receiving. This was sort of the opposite of a push to talk button. This was a push to listen button. Now, of course, this type of switch is not necessary when you're transmitting over radio, but early radio telegraphists used ordinary telegraph keys because that's what was available. But as terrestrial telegraph networks shut down and telegraphy moved more and more into radio, then these switches started to disappear from newly manufactured telegraph keys. Now, one last thing worth pointing out is how this is actually wired. So while the three contacts on the pendulum itself are connected through these metal straps on the bottom, this terminal here, as well as one pull of the switch, are screwed directly into the cast iron base so that when the switch is closed, the current travels directly through the base itself. Now, the Viberplex company has been in business for over 120 years, and as you can imagine, in that time, they've produced a bunch of different products with hundreds of different design variations. For example, in 1907, Horace Martin introduced the double lever vibroplex, where pushing on one lever produced a dash, whereas pushing on the other produced a string of dots. This is intended to eliminate the problem of split dots, where you would cut off a dot halfway through transmitting it by flicking the lever away prematurely. In 1911, they introduced the direct point or model X, which used a single contact to generate both dashes and dots. While in 1913, they introduced the number four, or blue racer, which was a much smaller stripped down vibroplex for the telegraphist on the go. However, as I've said before, this is not intended to be a collector's channel. And if I went through all the different variations of vibroplex keys that have been produced over the last 120 years, we would be here all day. So instead, if you want to find out how the design evolved over the years or identify a particular model you might have in your collection, I've included links to a number of very detailed collector's guides down in the description. However, I can tell you a little bit about this particular example I have here. This is a number six or lightning bug model, which was introduced in 1927. And the distinguishing features of the lightning bug are these triangular plates supporting the trunnions for the pendulum as well as this goalpost or M-style support for the pendulum damper. 
And the subsequent model, the Champion, was a simpler and cheaper version of the number six, with a much simpler support for the pendulum damper, and which eliminated the circuit closing switch. Now, if we look at the nameplate, we'll see that this includes all of the relevant patents, as well as the serial number, which indicates that this particular example was manufactured in 1944. Now, during the Second World War, the number six, or lightning bug, was widely used by the U.S. Army Signal Corps under the designation J-36, with examples being produced for the military not only by Vibroplex, but also J.H. Bunnell, the Brooklyn Metal Stamping Corporation, and the Lionel Company. Yes, the manufacturers of toy trains. But while this example was produced in 1944, it has a civilian rather than a military nameplate, which was very distinct. And continuing to look at the nameplate, you will notice that this bears Vibroplex's iconic lightning bug logo, which it adopted in 1919. And interestingly enough, this logo and name are intimately tied with the story of how bug came to mean a mistake or a glitch in a system, for example, a software or computer bug. Now, this is a very complicated and very contentious story. If you want to learn more about it, I did write an entire script about it for Today I Found Out, link in the description. But in summary, there are two possible origins for the term being used in this manner, though both may have contributed in some way. One is that bug is simply a contraction of bugbear, a recurring annoyance, whereas the other dates back to the 1870s and was related to telegraph technology at the time, specifically harmonic or multiplex telegraphs, which could send multiple signals over the same wires simultaneously. Now, when this equipment switched polarities, it sometimes produced a phantom signal or click, which sounded like an insect and became known as a bug. And indeed, when Thomas Edison tried to come up with a circuit to counter this effect, he called it a bug trap. Whatever the case, by the 1880s and the 1890s, the term was well established to mean some sort of error in a man-made system. It was also used as an insult against inexperienced or unskilled telegraphers who would send inaccurate or garbled messages. Now, when semi-automatic keys like the Vibroplex came on the market, more traditional telegraphers would scoff and say that only a bug or inexperienced telegrapher would use anything other than a traditional straight key. And so the term bug became applied not only to the telegraphers, but also to semi-automatic keys themselves. And by the 1910s, this had become so prevalent that Viroplex decided to embrace it and incorporate it into their marketing. And so these keys have been known as bugs ever since. So now you know. You also know that the traditional story of the world's first bug being a literal moth that flew into and shorted out the Harvard Mark II computer in 1947 isn't the actual origin of this term. It had been in widespread use for many decades before this. However, this was likely the first use of the term specifically in the field of computing. Now, as I mentioned, the Vibroplex company still exists. It is currently headquartered in Knoxville, Tennessee, and produces 27 different designs of telegraph key, including traditional straight keys and classic Vibroplex semi-automatic keys. They also produce a number of digital keys, including the VibroKeyer, which is a classic Vibroplex mechanism adapted for use with a digital keying system, as well as something called an iambic paddle key. And this has two vertical paddle-shaped keys, and this can be programmed into a variety of different configurations depending on the user's preference. So for example, you can configure this so that pushing on the right paddle produces a string of dots, pushing on the left paddle produces a string of dashes, while squeezing them together produces a string of dots and dashes. And that is the fascinating history of the Vibroplex key. Now, that's all I have for you today. I'll see you next time in another video or look at yet more fascinating telegraphic equipment and other devices like this one. But in the meantime, if you're looking for a great read in which the Viroplex key plays a prominent role, why not check out my novel, Calling All Stations? This is a classic adventure yarn set in 1920s Morocco. It has pirates, the French Foreign Legion, battles in the desert, and early ham radio. What more could you want? Copies are available on Amazon, on the Publisher Freezing Press's website, and my own website, link in the description. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.